This is the story of a land that has suffered, that has been stripped of its bounty by a people struggling to survive in a changing world. This is a story about climate change and how the relationship between two groups of people 5,000 miles apart is improving each other's lives. This is a story about a community that is helping itself, that is open to change and wants to help the world beyond its horizons. It's also a story that is continuing to unfold. <laughs> So Musa says that uh, some years back, a long time ago, uh, this area was good and it was uh, fertile and there were several animals here, big uh, animals like buffalo, lions and uh, leopards, but uh, nowadays we don't see them, they, are, they have migrated to some other areas. There were some big trees just uh, under this uh, valley. But now they have been cleared, so, so we don't see such things. But something good is that uh, since the World Forest Organization came, things have started uh, changing because of the uh, planting of trees. So people are now taking care of the, the, the forest. And it has, it has started now gradually just going back. We hope that uh, our forest really will just come back and uh, we shall have our original things like before. You know, it is good we have the World Forest Organization because what they say always, it happens because if they say they will help, then they really help. My name is uh, Alex Katana and I'm um, the project manager here in Bore. Uh, my role is to take care of everything what is happening in this project and the tree planting. There's the World Forest uh, Organization, they have helped us uh, much because they are contributing and we are making big nurseries like this. Currently we have one, 110. Uh, thousand seedlings, different species. So everybody is happy because we are doing this work so that we can distribute in schools, in uh, churches, and uh, in individuals. It's simple. The Word Forest Organization supports Alex and his project, the Bore Green Umbrella, to encourage communities and schools to plant trees in the region. For every 4,000 trees a school plants, we fund the building of a classroom, which costs £10,000. And it's not just the local people who benefit from these trees being planted. It's really the tropical forests that do the donkey work, the heavy lifting of cooling the planet. You've got to be planting trees in the tropics. Because of the location of this particular project, really smack on the equator, the sun is, is fiercely hot and it, 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 it's, it's driving the photosynthetic absorption of carbon in a way that just doesn't apply in, in, in northern latitudes. So the trees grow incredibly fast. They absorb carbon perhaps 10 times faster than, than trees up in the north. So if we're serious about tackling climate change, we need to be planting many, many more trees with communities like these in the tropics. It was meeting Rue that helped us to understand how effective and important it is to plant trees near the equator. And this is how our relationship with Bore began. Oh, it's, it is. 2012, 150 trees planted for our wedding. Fantastic. And now six metres tall and solid. Mm. I remember when our mate said, what do you want for your wedding? What do you want? What do you want? And they said, toaster. nothing. No. Nothing. We don't need anything. We've got stuff. We've got all we need. They said, come on, we've got to buy you something. And I said, really, we don't need anything. And they said, we've got to do something to mark your union. So we said, right, plant us some trees. Yeah. And they said, that's a okay. bit random, but all right then. And they did. 150 <laughs> did. trees at £2.50 a tree. I'm really, I, I can't believe just how fantastically successful all of this has been. 
from little wedding forests, classrooms, the mothers of the forest, I the know. forest centre that we've helped contribute towards. The thing is, is we never set out to do all that. We just set out to plant trees. But yeah. it's all the stuff that's happened as a result of that that's made yeah. a massive difference. This was where it all started. These are the very roots of the World Forest Organisation. It is. We have come to visit some projects and learn more about what can be done in this area to help people lift themselves out of poverty. This year, we organised our second international tree conference in the Bore Community Forest Centre. We invited 25 experts from across Kenya, Uganda, England and Wales to share best practice for protecting and expanding the forests. Tell me how deep it should be. To offset the CO2 for their travel, they each planted a tree. I'm now digging a hole to grow a tree. I'm planting 2,000 trees for my birthday come next month. This is my 4,508 tree that I've planted on my own. As World Forest Organization, we've had the planting of over 40,000 trees so far. Though it's not enough, but I think it's going to sink part of the carbon that I've created. This sapling was planted in the Bore Green Umbrella main nursery. During the dry season, we do the nursing, and then when rain comes, then we transfer, we transplant the uh, seedlings to to the community chambers. In this uh, project here, we are, we, are, we are not allowed to sell the, the seedlings, actually. Uh, we, 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 di we distribute it freely. We don't have to sell. It's amazing seeing trees going into the ground and showing people what £2.50 does. It buys these saplings. There's 110,000 saplings down there to choose from. And each of them, in a tiny handful of years, about five years, will have absorbed about a quarter of a tonne of CO2. Every time somebody helps us to put a tree in the ground, we're, we're not just planting a tree. We are, we are planting a legacy. These things will be here, potentially, for hundreds of years. And like after about five years, a mango tree will give you 100 pieces of fruit. That will just keep going on. Good, good tree planting, Simon. You could get yourself a job here, mate. Thanks. Hot work, <laughs> um, but very rewarding. This is what the word forest is all about, really. It's trees. But this is a hard and uncompromising land. Dry for nine months and very wet for three. Planting trees is not as straightforward as just putting them in the ground. You know, I normally say uh, tree growing uh, is different from tree planting. Growing trees is, is from, it's like, I normally use the example of giving birth. When you give birth, you don't leave your kid just unattended. So when you grow trees, you really take care of the tree from the seedling uh, till it grows to maturity. And I'm very happy that the community is buying the idea of growing those trees so that they can, they can mature. And they are benefiting from uh, slowing down the climate change, which is really, really affecting them. We've learned over 10 years working here that if you just plant trees, you're not really going to make a, a kind of a sustainable intervention. You have to do a whole range of allied kind of collateral initiatives, and the World Forest are, are doing many of those. What Rue means is that a community that is being encouraged to plant trees rather than fell them still needs to make money. Drought and poverty have driven many people to making and selling charcoal, even though it is illegal. As tree cover disappears, so does wildlife. The area just gets hotter and hotter and harder to survive in. But local problems require local solutions. In any country, in any economy, in any locality, you always have to remember that the owners, the primary uh, stakeholders of that particular resource <clears throat> are the people living locally in that particular area. And to make proper decisions, you have to give that responsibility to the community living within that particular project. They understand what they are facing, they understand how the system, the ecosystem works, so it's better for them to be given the opportunity to make the, the decisions for themselves because they understand what is better and what will work for them as the community. If you start making decisions from outside, just trying to, you might end up importing 
a certain technology, importing a technique which does not apply locally. So involving a community is a very good thing and I'm sure that with, uh, with that kind of uh, procedure then uh, the World Forest Organization will be able to implement most of its projects, especially in collaboration with the community because they, they are kind of holding the community responsible for their own resources. What we have come to understand is that we need to support people to grow trees, give them an incentive and help to spread the word that we should not be cutting down trees for charcoal, but planting them. In February 2019, with financial assistance from the Welsh Government, we invited 25 experts to attend the Clean the Air Conference and Community Day. How to reform the banner? Now we have to offer an alternative. Over four days of workshops, group discussions and presentations, these environmentalists, tree growers and government representatives shared knowledge, experience, food and thoughts. How do you get a charcoal burner to change their ways? What alternatives are there to using wood for cooking? How do you encourage traditional cultures to adopt new ideas? This was local people working towards local solutions. All this culminated in a community day when we invited the people of Bore to come and celebrate with us and share the fruits of our discussions. Behind me you can see all the preparations that are going on for the community celebration. 750 people are going to come here and the delegates that we've gathered will want to present their thoughts but also want to listen to the thoughts of the community. <laughs> The attendance you can see today, let's say each of us, if could have uh, at least 100 trees, then could be a lot of trees. So, we so that we can even uh, leave this uh, charcoal burning. The community did gather. Over 800 men, women and children came from miles around to get involved in the event. The delegates shared thoughts and they in turn learned from the locals. The day was centred around the importance and benefits of growing trees. Local women's group, the Mothers of the Forest, decorated trees with messages on knitted squares, giving the trees themselves a voice. Trees are alive. They also arranged for pledges to be signed, committing to plant more trees and protect the forest. There was also room for personal pledges and suggestions for what could be done in the future. Food was provided. We are cooking rice mixed with meat, which we call plow. Goat stew and rice, for that amount of people, takes a lot of preparation and Moses and his team started cooking very early that day. The local Gairama people gave back, performing songs and dances. Local schools performed plays with messages of saving trees and protecting the environment. When the youth has adopted the message, then we know it has really taken root. Food was served and over 800 people sat and ate together, united by a common purpose of protecting and respecting their land and community. The children danced and the elders talked and by sundown, a new era of Bore Community Forest had dawned. The delegates had become advocates. I feel more energetic to continue with what I'm doing because I've gotten strength for people who are doing the same things and even better things that I'm doing. So I've gotten more inspiration. I've gotten more uh, new ideas and better ideas to improve my working with communities and children. It will help me grow more in terms of, as a tree grower, this is what I needed and I've, I've, I've gained a lot of knowledge from, from the whole conference for the past few days that I've been here. Key players in the organisation of this event was the women's group, the Mothers of the Forest. My name is Eva, Evelyn Jeffa and I am the facilitator of the Mothers of the Forest. 
here at uh, the Bore Forest Community Center. The mothers of the forest are creating awareness on climate change. And we have two meetings in a month. The World Forest Organization sponsor us so that we can be able to continue doing what we are doing. The Mothers of the Forest have formed an incredible group, giving each mother 800 shillings, just over six pounds, to plant four saplings a month ensures they have enough to keep their family for a week. This means they don't turn to charcoal production to make money. They also, in turn, encourage the community to plant trees. Within the first year of existence, they have their own micro-banking system, fresh water kiosks and social support network. This week, they are starting literacy and numeracy lessons. Despite their incredible resourcefulness, many of these women never went to school. Michael Jeffwa is their educator. I'm going to teach somebody who has never gotten any chance to be in school, but now the school has followed that person back at her age. OK, so right now we're preparing to have our first lessons, the Mothers of the Forest first lessons. We have three groups. We have the first group, which is the first group there? The first group there is for the ones who at least know how to read and write a little bit. We have this group here, which is this group, teacher? It's the first time for them to start reading and writing. Nice. Okay, so this is the group that has never, ever done any reading or writing. And then we have the third group there that know how to write and read a little bit. There are 40 mothers of the forest. Some of them walk for up to two hours to get to the center. They meet twice a month, which gives the women a rare opportunity to come together share best practices for looking after the forest, and to learn new skills. Okay, M-O-F-A, Mothers of the Forest Academy. An additional benefit of the newly formed academy is that their children have a chance to attend the lessons with their mothers, giving them a head start for future learning. For some, it was their first opportunity to even hold a pencil. Okay, so this is Harusi. And uh, Harusi has never, never gotten the chance to like, go to school. And she doesn't know how to read or write. She doesn't even know how to hold a pencil properly. So it's, it's a bit of a challenge for her. This makes me like, really value education. With just a small amount of funding from the word forest, the Mothers of the Forest has become a self-sustaining school that educates itself. Two hours of learning like this is going to have a massive impact on these women's lives. If you educate a mother, you educate a community. So these are the first words that they're actually writing. Wow. <laughs> for Joyce, she is so excited to know how to read and write because it's a challenge for her when she's traveling and she doesn't know where she's going. She doesn't know how to read the signboards. So she's really looking forward to reading and writing because at least finally she'll be able to read the signboards on the road. <laughs> That's really nice. Wow. Okay, Esther says that um, she's really happy with all this learning because she has a small business and she's not really good with the maths. So she's really eager to start learning maths and know how to keep her records right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Lois says that she's really, really happy to learn how to read and write. Because even when her children go to school and they come back home, she's able to help them and see what they've done in school for the day. That is really nice. So I think the lessons are finished now and um, we're just about to start our table banking. The table banking is when the mothers are given the money to plant their saplings. It also makes loans so that the women can set up businesses or help with short-term cash problems. The small interest that's made goes back into the kitty. She had borrowed 500, which is brought back with 50 shillings. So this is our profit. This is the, the group's profit. Oh, that is, OK, that's, that's nice. So the husband is the one who asked her to come and borrow from the charmer, from the group, so that they can go and pay 
clear the schools, the child's school fees. And now he is the one who gave her back the 550 to bring back to the group. So that's a good thing. I mean, we're helping our families. After we're done with our table banking, we have a lovely meal. Everyone is able to take clean, fresh water, which is really important for us. Unusually, the meal is prepared and served by a man. I have cooked uh, rice and a chicken and a soup. It's our time to just sit back and let the men do the work, yeah. <laughs> Being a part of this is just a great joy. The community is happy. The Green Umbrella supplies the, the, the seedlings. And we, the mothers of the forest, try as much as we can to go out to the community and really explain to them how this climate change is affecting us and the word spreads on how we can best take care of our forests. The positive impact that the mothers are having is immense and changing lives and landscapes across the region through their outreach and alternative income generation ideas. Many women who once made charcoal now grow and sell fruit and nuts. This is Esther's farm. We call it Shamba in Swahili. And uh, Esther has planted eight acres of cashew nuts and, and mango trees. All the trees here that you're seeing here are actually four years old. The mangoes produce fruit on the fifth year, so they are quite young. We have this, this, cash, this cashew nut. Ah, no, we're not going to pluck it. Okay, this is really, really small. It's going to take like another three months to mature up. This one is coming up slowly. And we have one lovely ripe one here. And the cashew nuts themselves, once they're dried, they can be sold in the local market. Some of them are exported. And it's a really good source of income for the locals around here. Esther used to burn charcoal. She, she, this land was full of trees and she had cut them down because of burning charcoal. And after that, after all the trees were gone, she had no other source of income. So she decided to plant the, the cashew nut trees and the mango trees and now they have become a source of income. And they keep on producing fruit yearly and yearly. So she doesn't have to worry about her income anymore. This is the cashew nut and this is the cashew nut fruit. Now all you have to do is just squeeze a little. It's really juicy, so it's going to like, uh, you just, oh, look at that, look at that. And Esther, would you like some? Yes. Oh, okay. I'll give you some. Yeah, you take this one. Okay. So it's, it's really sweet. It's kind of, it has a bitter taste to it at the end, but it's sweet. Mm. Mm. When you squeeze the juice out and you're making porridge for your babies, yeah. You put in this, uh, the cashew nut juice inside and it has, and the porridge has this bittersweet taste and the kids just love it. How much can you make like for the whole of eight acres? Three bags. Three bags? Three bags, Three bags of cashew nut. cashew nut. It is really expensive and I'm amazed that Esther gets three 90 kg bags of this. Because a kilo in Malindi goes for something like 140. Yeah. Esther, I envy you. This is a really good source of income. Thank you. I'm going to plant more cashew nuts also. <laughs> <laughs> so no, Esther, do you no. still do charcoal? No, no. And I don't want to do it again. Well, thank you. We have that. Esther is no longer doing charcoal. Yeah. She does not want to do charcoal anymore. And she is planting more trees. Yeah. Esther is actually a pastor, and even after the sermons, after the sermons in the church, she tells people the, she tells people the importance of planting trees and of conserving the forests. This is a mango tree. It's also grown around here. There is so much we can do with them apart from just eat the fruit. We can dry them. We make something known as achari. It's it's a dried mango fruit that the children really love. And it also sells really good and quick in the schools. Four years time, this place will have transformed. You wouldn't recognize it. It will be a totally different place with all the trees being so leafy and shady. All the mothers of the forest, we've encouraged them to like really plant, especially the cashew nut tree and the mango tree. We also have others planting the moringa and uh, the neem tree. Most of the mothers have not less than 100 trees, not less than 100 trees, each mother. 
40 of us, that's quite a few trees. <laughs> I'm so proud because the one that we're leaving for our children is much, much better because we're really, really planting more trees. And that makes me happy. It is a harsh fact that women have a heavy workload here. They look after the children, cook the food, fetch the water, and the opportunity to earn a little cash on top of that is a big bonus and a source of empowerment. It is so impressive how resourceful they can be. So I'm here at the Habu's house. This is the Habu's place. And um, the Habu is making a living by selling, we call this omena, it's the small fish. And I see she's doing pretty well. Asante sana. So the Habu is uh, a mother of the forest. She used to earn a living out of making charcoal. And she came to us when she had no more trees to cut. When she came, she asked us if uh, we can help her plant more trees, if we can show her how to plant the trees and educate her more on the tree planting and everything. And we, the mothers of the forest, we accepted her. We, we wanted her to come into the group so that she can stop all this charcoal burning and everything. It was really nice for the Habu to come into the group. Now, through the table banking of the mothers of the forest, the Habu is able to buy and sell this small fish. She makes something like 200 per day. It is not much, but it is enough to keep her going, which is a really good thing. The Habu has planted over 50 neem trees. 50 neem trees, that's a really good start. And apart from that, she's no longer doing charcoal. She's having her business. She's earning, earning her daily living. Okay, the Habu says that ever since she started this business, she can be with her family more. She doesn't have to be in the forest cutting trees and all that. She is with her family more. She's actually able to pay for the little ones that are in school. She can pay for them without much hassle. And she feels it's a good thing. She feels proud that she has stopped cutting down the trees and um, she also wants to plant 100 trees. The major problem around here is water. We don't have many, um, we call them the water kiosks, and we don't have many of that. The few that are here, some of us can't afford to buy that water. So we go and fetch from the rivers. This is a big problem. Drinking from the rivers here can be fatal, and waterborne diseases are responsible for the deaths of over 5,000 children across Kenya a year, and combating this is a challenge. With drinking water here, it is a real uh, problem because uh, they normally dig some small wells to get the water. And normally they, they have uh, stomach ache, diarrhea, so many sicknesses. To identify the safe and unsafe sources of water, we arranged for Steve Pooley, a bushcraft and survival teacher, to come and test the water at various locations. Today he is here at the Sabaki River, the main source of water in the region. It is known to be polluted from its source just outside Nairobi to its mouth in Malindi. Uh, the locals, have, on the various meetings we've had, have told us that they're not collecting water uh, from the river. But as you can see, they're making wells wherever they can. The animals are basically just feeding and having its waste go straight into the water. And that's exactly where they're drinking from now. Many of the samples Steve took were contaminated and could prove to be fatal to the very young and the elderly. Although the water looks clean and safe, looks can kill. What's going to happen now? OK, basically what's going to happen is the bacteria in this solution will take between 24 and 48 hours. And at the end of that 48 hours, it'll do one of two things. It'll stay either clear or yellow, which means that water is clear and good to drink. Or it will go a dark shade of blue or green. And this will tell you that it's contaminated with one of two things, whether it be animal or human waste. And that, that, that bacteria is unfit for human consumption. And that's what we're trying to process here now today. The results that day 
showed that the natural filtration from the sand and the riverbed cleaned the water sufficiently to make it drinkable. But this is not always the case and varies from well to well. So the 20 kilogram load of water on this woman's head should not make her family sick today. For those who have the money, there is an alternative to this uncertainty. This is a water kiosk, and it used to be run by the Bore Green Umbrella, but then they handed it over to the mothers of the forest. It comes here by pipe all the way from Baricho. For five of these 20 liter jerry cans, it's 10 shillings. That makes one to be two shillings. At the end of the month, we pay the water bill, and whatever is left, it goes into the Mothers of the Forest account. Despite the apparent vastness of this land, it is quite densely populated and housing is an issue for many people. Within sight of the forest centre, Alex became aware of a neighbour's predicament that prompted him to approach us for some special funding. So this is the, the family of Kaneno. They really need assistance. So inside there, it's only one bed for 13 children plus uh, her. All the children are just sleeping on the floor. I'm very happy to see that uh, uh, they have a new house there. And uh, they used it to, to make some charcoal for their like, source of income. But uh, due to the house, now I think they have changed. It's uh, two weeks now that they, they, they have gone to another uh, source of income. She's now selling uh, fish, just a fish, and she's uh, taking the fish to several um, homesteads. It cost £1,200 to rehouse Canino, a small investment that will affect the lives of 14 people and prevent them from becoming charcoal burners too. So this is where Kaneno is going to be sleeping. This is going to be Kaneno's bedroom with the lead, the youngest, and the second youngest. This is going to be the girl's bedroom. And it's a really nice big room. This is going to be the boy's room. It's going to be really nice, a nice feeling to wake up in the morning and not feel tired. I like it. I'm feeling proud. Since we helped, no charcoal burning now. So he says ever since they got the beds, now when they wake up in the morning, they don't feel tired because, you know, sleeping on the floor is really tiresome. So, yeah, they're really happy. And they go to school when they're, like, really fresh. Ever since the house started being built, she was, like, really, really happy. And she feels like she has had a second chance and she's a changed woman. This is our school. We want to become friends with others. So this is our very, very first twinning with Michael Jeffers School, the Gracious Junior Academy, and a Montessori school in North Somerset. And I cannot tell you how excited we are. We know these children. This is a great opportunity for the kids. Yeah, this is called Gracious Children's Centre. And we have children from the last 14 families and most of them, their families are very poor and some are single parented. So we just brought them here so that they can get education like, just like the other children in other schools and from very privileged families. They can share information from the other school and they will get to understand each other's life patterns and you know how the culture here in Kenya is and how the culture is in England. Really they are going to learn a lot of things in their life. All over the world can see that we have children who in the future are going to conserve environment. So, Michael, can I present you with your certificate? Oh, very Some nice. Details there. Thank you very much for presenting this one for me. And I know they will really love and really plant more trees because of okay. the effort that we're doing. Klein Kinder School in Somerset stands to learn so much from this twinning. 
Here is a school that has zero truancy level and despite its lack of resources and support is succeeding in producing students that want to learn, speak two languages and have dance moves and songs that are off the scale. What's not to like? It is only education that will break this cycle of poverty. But even the schools are poor here. So building classrooms in return for planting trees is such a perfect combination. We are here at Amkenny School. This is one of many schools that I've seen in this condition. Sticks and mud just really being held together. Children squashed into very cramped conditions. Desks and chairs that are being held together on a wing and a prayer. The new classroom is going to make such a difference. It does make such a difference to their learning. We were talking to the headmaster at Kundeni Primary the other day. Their exam results have gone up by 14 percentage points because they've been in a calm, quiet and cool environment to learn. And that's what's going to happen here. It's what's happening at all of the other schools that we've built classrooms in. This is the latest classroom that we've built. It's phenomenal to be here because the last eight classrooms that we've done, we've only seen photographs and videos. They've built this classroom in record speed because they knew we were coming over and it's still being painted as we're, as we're here. So this is absolutely the pinnacle of our work. Planting the trees is, is important, but we actually need to support the people who are doing the planting. And the way we do that is by facilitating education and building classrooms is just one of the simple ways of doing it. Oh, it just feels so cool. When you walk in from outside, you've made these classrooms work so well. Everybody has worked so hard. Alex, the Bore Green Umbrella. You guys are amazing. Well, this is wonderful, so that uh, these children can learn in a very good environment that is uh, conducive for learning and actually improve their performance. Because the new classes are well structured, the walls are strong, unlike the ones we have, which are broken, the children's marks will be better because the children will be able to do a lot of work during bad weather conditions. Hi, Habari Asubuhi. So this is the official handover at uh, Amkeni School. It's a big deal for the community. I mean, this thing can take hours. It can take most of the day. The kids are all excited and the parents have gathered behind me. When I came here, classes were not in good order. So we decided to build. But we realized that you, uh, you had that uh, power and the strength to plant the trees. And we added you some more. We were honoured to be asked to open the classroom. If we take care of the children, the whole community will change. Creating awareness on climate change, I mean, it's something that has been talked about so many times, but no one has really been able to get a whole community together. Tracy and Simon had a dream, and they looked for the right people to, to accomplish their dream. Why would they come all the way here to come and plant trees, or to come and pay us to plant trees? But then when, once I understood that the same same trees that we plant are the same same trees that are giving them oxygen, I, I got the idea. So it's, it's, it's a win-win situation.